RJ Rajajaksha from Barclays Capital Offices here in London. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Sure. Um, I, I'd like to begin by asking you about what is happening at St Jackson's Hole right now and how confident are you, if you're confident at all, that uh, Ben Bernanke may be able to turn things around? Uh, I'm not very confident at, at all. I think uh, the bond market and to some extent the stock market might have gotten ahead of itself. The Fed is not supposed to come in waving a wa magic wand every time asset prices fall 10-15%, right? I think what the Fed is going to look at are a couple of other things. One is whether there truly is a significant negative feedback loop between this asset price fall and the real economy. And I think the Fed will say the jury is still out on that. And number two, financial market conditions in general, you really cannot argue are very tight. That is not an environment in which you have companies announcing multi-billion dollar takeovers as has happened over the last couple of weeks. So stocks have fallen, yes, they've fallen sharply, absolutely. But are they that much lower than they were, where they were at the start of this year or when QE2 started? The answer is probably not. And I don't see the Fed coming to the rescue just because of this stock price move. Mm. So what are you expecting from Ben Bernanke? You're not expecting any key policy uh, announcements? I think what the Fed will do, what uh, Chairman Bernanke will do is make soothing noises. He will actually do pretty much close to what he did in August 2010 at Jackson Hole a year ago, which the market somehow seems to have forgotten. The Fed didn't actually announce the second round of quantitative easing at Jackson Hole last year. What it did was laid out its options the market made up its mind, and three, four months later, the Fed delivered. But at that point, the Fed absolutely did not announce QE2. And similarly, tomorrow, we do not think the Fed will announce QE3. Uh, looking what is, at what is happening uh, to U.S. Treasuries at the moment, do you think that they are pointing towards the possibility of a double dip? I think uh, U.S. Treasuries two weeks ago were actually pointing to a heavy amount of Fed buying in the 10 and 30 year sector because what happened was what we think of as real yields which is US Treasury yields absent the inflation component went through zero. That kind of thing either happens because of massive risk aversion which you could very well argue was part of the reason but if that happens then inflation break evens don't go up which also happened two weeks ago. Last week those break evens also started to come off that in my mind was more true risk aversion and right now the, the, the bond market is basically saying you can't interpret it from an economic standpoint, but really what I believe the bond market is saying is that we expect the Fed to buy gobs of 10-year bonds over the next few weeks. I'd like to change tack a little bit and ask you about what's happening in Japan. We've got the Prime Minister stepping down. Uh, we've also got a very strong yen. Uh, what options uh, does the Bank of Japan have left to try and tame the yen? You know, this is the problem with, uh, for central bankers all over the developed world at this point, and not just in Japan, which is that for the most part, they have done a lot of things, and it really is up to the fiscal side, the legislative side, maybe even the regulatory side, to pick up the slack. It's up to politicians to get their act in gear. And unfortunately, that is just not happening. So the, the Bank of Japan can do some of the unconventional measures they talked about, but if the, if the argument behind trying to weaken the yen is to get the economy growing more strongly, then Japan needs other forms of reforms, reforms that the Bank of Japan cannot provide. Mm. And now, U.S. investors have, have cut their exposure uh, to European banks. Uh, do you see that money returning anytime soon? Uh, it's difficult to see that in this environment, but uh, the one thing I would like to point out is that this is not new. Big money market funds in the United States, uh, you know, some of them very vocally, very publicly, started reducing their exposure to European banks last year. And it wasn't because of fears about the Italian sovereign or the Spanish sovereign. It was simply because the fear was that some of these big banks had exposure to Greek debt. So I, I think the, the whole notion of a wholesale funding-driven bank run is just overblown. I find it very, very hard to, to see that happening in an environment where there is still so much liquidity sloshing around. So where do you look for an end to the European sovereign debt crisis? You, again, I, we go back to our point about uh, policy makers needing to do the right thing. Uh, there's a few options that they have, right? Uh, one is you actually do structural reforms quickly enough that growth comes back in countries where the market is questioning whether they can grow quickly enough to, to service their debt over the medium term. Yes. Uh, the second is you look to uh, 
monetization of sovereign debt till such point as growth comes back, which would mean the central bank doing a lot more heavy lifting, uh, which the U.S. has done, by the way. The U.S. central bank has, you could argue, been far more activist than the European central bank. And the third, obviously, is some form of fiscal union. So it really is, to, is up to policymakers to decide in which direction they want to go. And what we suspect is most likely to happen in fits and starts is that the third solution is the one that will eventually play out. Okay. RJ Rajajaksha, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.